Uh, you know, I don't know about you guys, I'm kind of kind of talk to guys today, obviously, so ladies, here's your chance to sit back and just kind of, well, I would say sleep, but don't do that in church, you know. If you're going to sleep, sleep like this, so it looks like the crane is. You sleep like this, and then everyone knows what you're doing, all right? The moment you say, hey, you don't have to listen to this, everyone's listening. So I know when I say, ladies, you don't have to listen, you're like, oh, I'm going to listen and see what he says about Holly. Anyway, I'm going to talk to you guys today. Let me just tell you where I was when I became a father. I was 28 years old when Caitlin was born. I'd already been in the Marine Corps for six years. I'd been out on my own and stuff. And I had learned a lot of different things. But I was completely terrified when I became a dad. I felt so unprepared. I didn't know how to do the things that dad was supposed to do. I didn't know much about babies. You know, I didn't... I, I mean, I could change oil. I didn't know how to change diaper. All right, that was kind of my that was one of my struggles. I didn't know anything about it. I didn't understand the I'm hungry cry, I'm mad at me cry, I need to be changed cry. I'm just a girl, and that's why I'm crying cry. You know, I didn't understand any of those kind of things. But Michelle did. She was such a godsend. And in those early days, when Katie would come home and you know she'd be crying, she'd be upset or whatever. I mean. I just, I didn't know. There's times I put her in a crib and I just walked downstairs and I'm like, she, she's got to be cried out of it. Whew, man, they can cry for a long time. I feel like a fire siren just gets louder and louder and louder and whew, hurts your ears. But anyway, you know, I didn't know how to deal with that sort of stuff. And I always felt like I was messing up. I always felt like I was doing something wrong. But you know, kids are resilient. Now, they, they're like gummy. They bounce back from a lot of things. And my kids have come through a lot of my bad parenting. But I'm thankful for that. But it was fearful. And it still is fearful at times. You think about the responsibilities that we have as parents and the responsibilities that we have as fathers. So I began to think about that, fearing and fatherhood and how they relate together. And just because we are maybe fearful of some things, it's not an excuse not to father. And we still need to push through it. So I began to think of some guys in the Bible who I think had some fears as they were a father. And it's got to start with Adam. Right? You think about Adam. Adam has two sons as it starts off, right? We have Cain and Abel. And you know that Cain gets upset, jealousy, and so he kills his brother Abel. you got to know that ruined Thanksgiving. I mean, the very first Thanksgiving dinner was messed up when you're like, hey, where's your brother? I don't know. He didn't show up. You know? That's not a good thing there. And then I think about Noah. You know, Noah had three sons, right? They, him, his wife, his sons, their wives, they survived the flood. And you know what happens? When Noah comes out of the ark and he sees all the destruction and how everything has been washed away, it gets him down, it gets him depressed. And the first thing he does when the grapes are grown is he presses them, he makes wine, and he gets drunk. He just kind of drinks his sorrows away. And his youngest son, Ham, comes in and he notices his dad's drunk and he's naked in his tent. And instead of covering up his father's nakedness and showing some respect, he goes and tells his brother, he's like, hey, hey, man, dad's all fine, he's in the tent, and he's making all this stuff, and a curse now comes down upon him. And you got to think, here's Noah, you know, everything is starting over, and one out of my three sons is already going down the path of waywardness. And then you got Abraham. Abraham had several sons, but the ones that we remember best were Ishmael and Isaac, right? Ishmael was a son that was born to Agar, the handmaiden of Sarah, and then Isaac was a promised child born about 13 years later, you know, to Sarah, the love wife. And you know the fighting that took place between them, right? Because Ishmael's making fun of Isaac, oh, you're still a little baby, and you know, you've got to be weaned off the bottle, and blah, blah, blah. And then that makes the boys upset, and when the boys are upset, mamas are upset, and we make fun of mama's baby, and the claws come out, and mama's like, yeah! And so here they're fighting, and what does Abraham have to do? Oh, I cannot take this fighting in the house, and so he's got to drive Ishmael and Hagar away. What a, what a terrible thing that was going on in his life. And then that continues on down, right? With Isaac, if you think about Isaac, he had two sons, right? Esau and Jacob, these twin boys, and they, they, they're just destined to be fighting from birth. Right? Jacob's the heel catcher, that deceiver guy. His name even just describes all of that. And so you know how he cheats his brother out of the birthright over a bowl of some split pea soup. You know, he comes in, oh, I'm so hungry. And sell me your birthright. Oh, here you go. And he eats his soup. And then he gets with his mom and they conspire to steal the blessing away from his dad that was due to the older son. And now he's so angry. He's all so angry that Jacob's got to flee. And he goes off to his uncle Laban's to live because Esau wants to kill him. And here Isaac is thinking, what is going on in my house? I wanted my sons to be together. I wanted them all to come over for Thanksgiving. 
Thanksgiving and Christmas and all these wonderful, you know, family times we're going to have and all that sort of thing. They didn't have Thanksgiving and Christmas in the Old Testament. You understand what I'm saying? But some of you are like, I didn't know that was in, it's in Leviticus 12. Go back and read it, all right? So they want to come over for all these celebrations and now we can't do that because these boys are fighting and that was a frustrating thing. And then you think about David. David, his son Solomon, the first, the first person to become king because of a bloodline, right? So you have Saul, and the Spirit of God left Saul, goes to David. David has a son, Solomon, now is that first in the long bloodline there. And yet Solomon, with all the wisdom that God had given him, still led the nation astray because of his love for his wife. Many of them were born, and they brought their pagan gods in, and he allowed that to infiltrate into the, into the nation of Israel. All 600 rise and 400 concubines. Now, I just wonder, how did he possibly remember all those anniversaries? I don't think so. Like, every day you would be in trouble. You'd be like, you know what today is? He's like, I know it's something. It's our anniversary. And he goes down there, it's our anniversary too. Why did you forget? I mean, I just would not have wanted to be in that house with him. Been a struggle, you know what I'm saying? It's bad enough for me to forget one anniversary, but man, you forget 600 of them. You are in big, big trouble. It's messed up. All right. <laughs> that is, that's a lot. I'm going to let that one go, okay? There are many more that we could mention here. We could talk about Eli the high priest and the problems he had with his two sons. We could talk about Samuel, the great prophet of God. But it's nothing negative is spoken of Samuel in the scriptures, but his sons did not follow in the way of Samuel. And so, in, in some respects, we can see that he probably maybe spent too much time being a minister than he did being a father to his family. We talk about Moses. And some of the issues that were on in Moses' his life and all that. And then go on and on and on of men in the Bible who I think had a very stressful fatherhood situation. But I think the one that had the most stress, at least in my opinion, it has to be Joseph. It has to be Joseph. Because Joseph, you think about it, all the fears that Joseph would have had being the earthly father of the very son of God. Like if that doesn't make you shiver in your boots, then, you know, there's something wrong with you. One of the problems would be that he would have to overcome the prejudices of not being Jesus' biological father. I know we live in a world where we have uh, adoptions and they had it back in that day and there's nothing wrong with that. Those are great, wonderful things. But in this case, you know that people were asking the question because of Mary being pregnant, already being married, and it's not Joseph's baby. And they're like, oh, what's going on here? And you believe that story? Oh, well, I got some property. I'd like to sell you, Joseph, in Jerusalem. It's, you know, it's oceanfront property in Jerusalem. And, and so he would have to overcome those prejudices. Think about the fear of knowing, what do I teach him? I mean, just imagine if you're Joseph, and, and, and what are you going to teach the Son of God? He already knows everything. You know, he was here. Going to pray. You know, I think about those things. I, I think about this. Maybe it's just me, but I think about the discipline issue. I mean, Jesus is fully human. He's going to grow up as a little baby. He's going to reach the terrible twos. Now, I just happen to think that he probably had a tantrum or two because he wanted some, something to drink. He wanted a little toy. He probably wanted that cradle, and they wouldn't give it to him. You know, the little, little Jewish you know. And you think, how do you discipline the Word of God? I mean, who puts the Son of God in the timeout form? All right? And I would bet that Joseph would say, hey, I'm not spanking. I already got two marks on it. This is your turn to spank me. You know, we got to share the load here. Someone else got to spank Jesus. I just wonder, that would stress me out. How do you discipline the Son of God as He's growing up? You know, with so many fears and so much anxiety, what did Joseph do then? How did he overcome all those things? How did he, how, how did he get and push through those fears to still be the Father that God has called him to be? Let me give you a couple suggestions as I read through the text, some of the things that I see that I want to share with you dads today. I think if we put these things together, it might help us to be better fathers. Number one is this. He loved Mary, the mother of Jesus. He loved Mary. You know, we know the story, right, about Mary and Joseph. You know how they were pledged to be married, which is much stronger than an engagement. And for all legal purposes, they are married. Just the marriage has not been consummated. But they're, they're seen as husband and wife. And yet, in this time, Mary comes out to be pregnant, right? Joseph knows it's not his. You know how the angel has to come and talk to him, take Jesus, take Mary home to be your, to be your uh, bride, and all those different things there. Mary has the dream and all that different stuff. And you know that Joseph does what he's told. He takes Mary home to be his wife. He loves her, and he stays with her. I think one of the greatest things 
that we can do for our children, dads, is to love our wives. We need to show them affection, and I think that it's right to show proper affection in front of your children because it lets them know that you care for her and that you love her. You know, there was a time when I would show affection to Michelle in front of our kids, and they'd be like, ooh, yuck, yeah, that's gross, ah, come on. Now they're just like, go get a room, guys. You know, but, but at least they know this. At least they know that their dad loves their mom. Because I want John to see that. Because I want him someday to show affection to his wife in a proper way. And so for my grandchildren, I want them to see that. I want Katie to have affection shown to her by her husband in a proper way. But, you know, when we don't model it, they won't learn it. And they won't, and if we don't model it in the right way, they won't learn it in the right way. They'll learn it in a wrong way. Because there's someone out there who will model some sort of affection to them, but it won't be God. And so we ought not be ashamed of those things. And we need to teach that to our kids. Love your wife. And that's one of the greatest things I can do uh, for my children is to keep my marriage strong, keep my marriage together. The Apostle Paul reinforced this love that a husband should have for his wife in Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wife, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. You know, Jesus dies for the church. You think about all that Jesus did for the church. This is right. He's coming again for the church. And he's saying, he's saying, husband, you need to love your wives in this way that it, it, it became their life or your life. You lay your life down. And that, that, that can be extrapolated to other things. What are you willing to lay down and give up for them? Are you willing to give up a career? Are you willing to give up a, a certain financial gain? Are you willing to give up a, a hobby? Are you, what are you willing to give up because you love them so much and it's for their benefit? Verse 28 says this is in the same way. Husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one hates his own body but feeds, but feeds and cares for it just as Christ does the church. I mean, I love my body. I, I feed my body well. Well, I feed it Twinkies. I feed it lots of Twinkies. All right? But, uh, you know, I'm not going to do harm to my body. And if, if that's how I feel about myself, then I ought not want to do harm to my wife. I should love her like I love myself. If I want to be comforted, if I want to have pleasure, if I want to have a, a, a release of fear, then I should bring all those things to her as well. Joseph might have had many fears about being the earthly father of Jesus, but he did not let them keep him from loving Mary. Guys, the world is pulling us in tons of different directions. And they're trying to redefine marriage. They're trying to destroy marriage. And, and, and I mentioned earlier, in, in the first sermon, I got, I got on this. I'm going to get on the same soapbox. Because some of us are hoping that the Supreme Court decision is going to solve all this issue for marriage. Let me tell you, it is not. It doesn't matter how that decision comes down. Marriage is not going to be solved at a judicial bench. It's going to be solved on our knees in prayer, reading the Word of God. We need to establish marriage back the way God intended for you. A couple guys and ladies on, on a legal bench is not going to solve that problem. It's not going to go away. It needs to be solved within the church and our society. We need to get back to the roots. And guys, we need to stand up and be what God has called us to be and love our wives and say, this is what marriage is. One man, one woman for one lifetime. Preach it, live it, model it. Number two is this. Joseph became responsible for Jesus. Any father who has adopted a child, I think, understands this concept far better than me. It is one thing to love and care for a child that you have helped to create. You know, we have that saying that only a mother can love, right? I mean, there are some children that are just like, they're, they're, to everyone else, they're like a, they're like a holy terror. I mean, they're like, they're like a beast that's ran wild. And, and, but, but someone will say, but their mother still loves them. And then sometimes we say, yeah, and only their mother could love them. But someone loves them. We say that, you know, so there's a love that we have because we're like, well, this is, this is part of me. This is part of, you know, I've helped you create this job. But there's a different kind of love that comes upon a person when they have chosen to take someone into their home and to be physically responsible and morally responsible and spiritually responsible for someone and love them as if they were from their own body. And that's what Joseph did. Joseph did that very thing. In verse 21 of Luke chapter 2, it says that on the eighth day when it came time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. Now in this little text right here, where two things are described here, talked about. Circumcision was the defining mark of Judaism in the male child. Joseph wanted to make sure that Jesus had done everything that was required so that he could be included in the nation of Israel, do all that God had asked him to do. 
do. He was fulfilling the, the rituals that he was required to do for Jesus. And then he gives him the name. Even though the name was told to him to give, he still does it anyway. And when he gives the name, it's saying that he is showing acceptance and he is showing authority over this person. He has accepted Jesus and he has earthly authority over him as he's a young child. Joseph is claiming Jesus in this moment as his legal son. Even if he's not my blood son, which he wasn't, right? I can see through the Holy Spirit. But Joseph is taking legal responsibility for him. And in verse 39, it says this, that when Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew up and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. Joseph provided for the physical needs of Jesus. That's what he's telling us. That he took him home, he did what he was required, he took him home, and he raised him up, and the child grew, he became strong, he was filled with wisdom and grace of God. In America, two out of every five children live in a home where the father is not present. According to the PBS website, the Association for Enforcement of Child Support estimated that approximately 30 million children are owed more than $41 billion in unpaid child support. That, that's not just like a deadbeat dad. That, that's both parents combined together. $41 billion is, is missing from supporting these children. Being a father isn't about just putting bread and butter on the table. Although that's certainly a big part of it. But it's more than that. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says. If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for his immediate family, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. I mean, Paul is saying that if you have the means to do so and you do not provide for your family, you are worse than an unbeliever. That that is not how a Christian acts. That is not how a child of God acts towards his family. You know, we, we need to start teaching people that we are to care for our family first. Dad, you need to care for your family first. There are people who come to the church all the time, and we ask them, do you have any family? Well, I got family. well why are they not helping you? Your family should come first. That is your first line of defense. And when you do not help your immediate family, especially, Paul says, especially your immediate family, you have denied the faith. You are worse than an unbeliever. Dads, we need to be caring for our children. We need to be providing for our children and looking after them. And when our children go come into struggles and come into hard times, we ought to be the first line of defense. We ought to be the ones who do that. And if we have the means and we don't do that, then we are denying the faith. And, you know, and I'm not talking about if you don't have the means, you don't have the means. I, I, but if we have the means, God expects us to move and provide for our children. And Joseph did that. He provided for his family. He took Jesus home to Nazareth and he raised him up as his own son. He put food on the table. He put a roof over his head. And as a result, Jesus grew and he was filled with wisdom and he was filled with the grace of God. What else did Joseph do as a father despite his fears? Number three is this. He trained Jesus in the Word of God. Now, I, I think this is interesting. How do you train Jesus in the Word of God? He wrote it. I mean, he, 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 him, the Father, and the Spirit, they're all one, right? We believe in a triune God. They understand, they know, they think and act as one. They, they're together in a relationship that we can't possibly understand. So when the Holy Spirit was moving these men to write these things, you don't think Jesus didn't know that? Of course he did. John tells us, and, and Paul says in Colossians as well, that everything was created by him and for him and through all things have their being. So I don't, I, I, as Joseph, you got to think, what am I going to teach him? You know, this is one child who truly was a know-it-all, you know? <laughs> Some of us, we think, we, our kids, they think they know it all, and, but they don't know it all. <laughs> Jesus needed to be educated in the Word of God. Education is critical to the success of a nation. The better educated a child is, the more likely they are to succeed in life, no matter what it is they want to do. You know, we are pretty good about general education. We push to go to graduate high school. We push to go to college. We push to go to a tech school. We push to get some sort of training. We push to get educated in some sort of way. We do pretty good at that, I think, as a nation. But we are absolutely terrible when it comes to spiritual education. We are so very, very lacking. Even in the church, our churches are full of spiritually illiterate people. Some of you in this audience today find yourself in that. You've come to church and you love God with all of your heart, but you know very little about the Word of God. That needs to change. We 
We need to be educated in the Word of God. Sometimes I think about when I say things like, oh, you know the story about Elisha, and people are going, Elisha, who's that? You know? Or, or I tell the story about, about Abraham, you think, oh, Abraham, Mark, and then John. No, not that Abraham. You know, you, you tell these things, but people don't know the story sometimes. And you don't have time to give all the backdrop. All I'm saying is we need to be educated in the spiritual things of life. Listen to some of the statistics about a fatherless home when education, just in life, is not taking place. 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. 85% of children with behavioral disorders come from fatherless homes. 71% of all high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. 70% of juveniles in state-operated institutions come from fatherless homes. Boys who grow up in a father absent home are more likely than those in father present homes to have trouble establishing appropriate sex roles and gender identity. I mean, you think about the issues in the world and that we have today when we got four, five, six year old little boys and they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't associate with other boys. They think that I'm a, I'm a girl trapped in a boy's body and we got, we got girls on this side. I, I'm a girl trapped in a boy's body. And next thing you know, we got a new Caitlin on the, on, on the new magazines and we're all saying, oh, When a father is not there to train up a young boy to tell him what it means to become a man, that God's made you this way and we're going to develop you into there, there's a problem. And we need to have the same way to train up our young girls to tell them that you're a woman of God and God has created you in a wonderful, beautiful way. And you need to embrace those things. Children need that. That's why we have the problems that we have. I don't think it's that they got something messed up in their mind, that no one's teaching them what they should be. And when we are teaching them what they should be, look at our world. Our world is teaching them what they should not be. That something is wrong with you. That God made a mistake with you. That you're messed up. I mean, how could you love a God when someone would tell you they put you in the wrong gender body? Like, how do you mess up like that? that to me, that seems like a big mistake, doesn't it? We need to teach them God put you right where He wanted you to be and help them to understand that. Boys are... Boys in fatherless homes are more aggressive in behavior. They are higher risk of becoming delinquents. They are double the risk of being involved in criminal activity. They are less likely to become high achievers. And the list goes on and on and on. Dads are very, very important. Moms are very, very important. We live in a society where we say, ah, it doesn't matter. It does. Now, I don't want to be a complete downer here. If you're in a fatherless home, I'm not here to beat you up. And you do not have to become a statistic. Because you have a heavenly father, even if your earthly father is gone, you have a heavenly father who cares for you. And you can follow his word, and you can still achieve, and you can still be successful, because he cares for you. Amen. And if you're a mom, a single mom, blessings to you. Do the best you can. Love and train up your children in the way they should go and turn them over to the Lord. It may not be the perfect situation, but it doesn't mean give up. And guys, maybe we should step in and help them out. To the fatherless child, take them along with you. When you're taking your son to do something, grab another boy and bring him with you. You step in and be that surrogate father. You be that Joseph to him. We need to do that. We need to do it. Listen to the words of Moses when he was speaking about the law of God. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 19, he said, Teach them to your children. He's talking about the things of God. Teach them to your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk down the road and when you lie down and when you get up. I mean, Moses was saying, you need to teach your children all the time. When you go walking in the park, talk to them about God and how He's created all these things. When you get up in the morning and you're making breakfast and you get ready for school, talk about how God's going to be with them today and pray for them. When you come home from school, ask them about how their day was and that God was watching over them while we're there. And when you have dinner in that night, talk about God, how He provided for you. We need to talk about God every chance we get. And, and, and I know this. I know that sometimes the opportunity to talk to my kids about God is because I mean, less and less because they talk to me. Less and less. How was your day? Good. I mean, I think I, I think I deserve more than good. You know, how well, was it? Fine. You know, hey, if you want another pork chop, you better give me five words. Okay? You know, talk to them and get them to understand that here's a moment. So when they open up and they ask you, how was your day? Talk to them about God. Moses is saying, every time you get a chance, talk to them and bring the Lord into it. Because the world is telling them all sorts of things. And you need to give them a good foundation. Train them up in the way of God. 
Jesus was trained up in the way of God. Yes, he was 100% God. But he was also 100% man. Don't ever forget that. If you forget that factor, all these things about Jesus go away. And he's not really the, account, the, the, the person that we can equate to. He didn't know everything about life from the moment he was born. He had to be taught how to read the scriptures. He had to be taught under the rabbis. He was taught in the synagogues. And Joseph taught him. And we see that displayed best when he was 12 years old, right? He went to the temple. In Luke chapter 2, verse 41, it says that every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of Passover. That means that this was their custom. That they, they, we might say today that every year they were in church. They were regularly where they were supposed to be worshiping God. And I would just tell you that in training your children, bring them to church regularly. And if they're living in your house, there shouldn't be an excuse where they wouldn't get out of bed today. Well, a big old pot of cold water will get them to move. I assure you. They might say some ungodly things and then they got to come to church and repent and beat them up. But you move them anyway. I mean, if you're paying the bills and putting food on the table, they come to church. I tell that to my kids. When you're smart enough to pay your own way, which is about right now, while you still have intelligence, but while you're here, we go to church. This is what we do. And whether I was a preacher or not, that's what we do. Because I tell my kids, sometimes they say, oh, I know I'm the preacher's kids. I go, ah! I don't want to hear because I'm a preacher's kid. I'm like, we do this because we're Christians. Whether I was preaching or not, we would do these things because it's what God's called us to do. And Joseph took Jesus to the synagogues and he trained him and he taught him because that's what they did. They honored the Lord. And while he was there, right, they, you know the story, he was there and then they got separated and Joseph and Mary started leading them back and they lost Jesus. I mean, how do you lose the Son of God? A big no-no, all right? Like, you don't even need a parenting book to know. Do not lose the Son of God. Not good. I'm sure Joseph came to Mary and said, hey, where's Jesus? And she's like, I don't know. He's like, oh, you lost the Son of God. You're in big trouble. And she's probably thinking, no, he's 12 years old. He's supposed to be with me. And he's like, oh, he ain't my responsibility. You're taking this one all on your own. And I, I bet no one slept that night. They come back to the temple, right? And where do they find Jesus? He's right there. And he says, Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. They were amazed at how he understood what those older men were talking about in the temple. They were amazed at how he could comprehend all those things. They were amazed at the answers that he gave to the questions they had. He was on their level and he was probably even beyond some of them. How did he learn that? I think there was efforts with Joseph teaching in the scriptures. And the Spirit of God was with him for sure. The last thing that Joseph did to father, even in spite of his fears, is that Joseph taught Jesus a trade. I don't know if you think about this very much, but I think about this a lot because I didn't always preach to make a living. There's, I did other things, and I think it's important to be able to do other things. Simply put, Joseph taught Jesus how to be self-reliant. Joseph taught Jesus how to be self-reliant. Now, now, how I grew up, when I, when I was in fifth grade, we moved out from where, where I lived, we kind of moved out into the country, and a whole lot of things changed in our life at that point. Because from fifth grade on, if I wanted clean clothes, I washed them. If I didn't wash them, I didn't have clean clothes. And you can wear jeans for about two weeks, and then nobody wants to be your friend. I know this for a fact, okay? So, you learn to wash clothes, all right? Undergarments got to wash more frequent than that. But anyway, all right, so I learned to wash clothes, and I, and I learned to do those things, and I would get myself up on the time I was in fifth grade, I'd get myself up to school, I had to walk to school, and I literally did have to walk to school uphill both ways. Because we lived in a driveway that went down, and then up and there was my school. So I walked uphill both ways, going to and from. I'm not even lying, making that up. Even if I rode the bus, I'd have to walk a half mile to the edge of the road, and I'd ride the bus for 100 feet to my school. So I just walked to school, all right? But I learned to get up, get myself dressed, get myself breakfast, and all those things, get to school. I was late many times, went to a lot of Saturday school to make up and be a lady. So, but anyway, I learned all those different things. When I went into the Marine Corps, and I was with these grown men, 18, 19, 20 years old, I could not believe I met so many of them that did not know how to wash their clothes. I mean, once we got out of boot camp and we were kind of, you know, you had to wash your clothes, iron your uniform, sew and mend different things. I knew how to do all that sort of stuff. I mean, that's just, my, my folks just taught me that, you know. I watched dad sew up his, his work clothes or whatever. I watched mom cook and different things. I learned how to do all these different things there. And it just amazed me. These guys couldn't, they couldn't do laundry. You know, everything came out pink. Well, there it all comes out like, like green, you know. But, 
you know, everything in email is just one color or whatever. You know, they didn't know how to balance a checkbook. I'm like, seriously, how do you not balance? I mean, there were people, I hope this is not you, they had checks, they figured they could keep writing checks. I got checks. <laughs> that doesn't mean there's money in the bank. I mean, these guys were balancing checks and there was all kinds. Of, I just couldn't understand that. All these things that allow me just to get through life, I kind of took for granted. I thought everybody was that way, but it's not true. Dad, we need to be training our children to stand on their own two feet. That's what I'm saying. We need to prepare them for the world in which we live. Sometimes that's a hard thing to do. Because we need to let them fail at different things. We need to let them make their mistakes. It's hard to let them do those risky things. But I fear that if we do not let them do those risky things and let them learn, we hamstring them for the cruelty of this world and they will not be prepared for it. I do not think it's right that every kid, because he was on the football team, got a trophy. Not every kid's worthy of a trophy. I don't think that everyone who plays is always a winner. I don't think that we should give them a, hey, you went to school, here's a certificate, good for you. You know, that is not life. Because you go to work for your boss and you think, oh, I thought everyone got a ring. I thought everyone got the corner office. I thought everyone got a, a business car. And you're like, no, you're not producing anything. You're not doing anything. And, and you're going to be fired. What? I thought everyone got a job for free. We have trained people in the world not to deal with failure. Not to deal with struggle. Not to deal with, you're not the best. You know, your kid is not the best singer. Your kid is not the most talented football player. Your kid's not going to be the next major league baseball player. He might be good at these things or she might be good at these things. But there's always someone better. And we need to teach them to win humbly and to lose graciously. And we need to teach them that sometimes we do things that we don't get in return. That's one of the great things I love about what Derek does with our kids is sometimes he makes them do service stuff, not so they can get paid, not so they get a reward, but so they learn to do something for somebody else. Just to do it because it's the right thing to do. And we need to train our kids in that. Teach them that there's something outside of themselves. Something outside of themselves. Joseph taught Jesus a trade. In Genesis 2.24 it says this. For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and they will become one flesh. When I read that passage, what that tells me is one day my children will leave my home and they will establish a home of their own. One day I'm not going to be the man in Katie's life. She's going to be attached to another man. And I certainly want to hope that that man knows how to provide for her. He knows how to work because I don't want to be paying for her and him the rest of my life. I got a new car I want to get, all right? I know it's out there somewhere. And I know that one day that John is going to be responsible for some other person's daughter. And I don't want that dad going, well, yeah, you did a good job with your son. I'm still paying for my daughter and your son. No, you talk bad about my son. I might have to take him out of that. I want them to cleave to somebody else this way God wanted them to do that. And they're never going to be able to do that unless I train them, unless I teach John how to be a man and stand on his own and provide for his family that God will bless him one day. And to teach, to teach Katie to stand on her own and to provide for herself and, to, and that she doesn't always have to be dependent on some man to do everything for and watch out for her because one day he might not be there. She might be by herself and I might be by her, but I might not be there. And uh, I want her to be self-sufficient and that's what I hear in this, that we leave our family that we create new families. And we need to be prepared for that. Joseph could not have known all that was going to happen in Jesus' life. He didn't know what God was going to do for his life. And so he set out to do the one thing practical he knew. He gave him a trade. He taught him carpentry. He taught him how to provide for himself. So whenever God finally does move in your life, you will know how to provide for yourself. And that's what Jesus did for 30 years. He saw wood and he hammered things together. And, and I, I Jesus made. I think the chair that Jesus made is far better than anything that Norm Avery or the New Yankee Workshop could ever produce. Could you imagine if that chair goes to auction? Here we have a chair. Who's it made by? Well, it's made by the very Son of God. Let's start committing that $700 billion. All right, can you take it? I mean, I would love to have that chair. Because if it breaks, I know it's got a good warranty, right? You know? <laughs> Joseph, I'm just saying, dads, teach your children some practical stuff to stand on their own. What were the results of Joseph's efforts? Jesus became, became a man who loved the unlovable. He worked hard with his hands until he was 30 years old. He followed after God, uh, after God's calling in his life as a preacher and teacher. He was courageous in the face of the religious elites. He was kind to those who were downtrodden. He was loving to the hurting. He was caring to the brokenhearted. He was compassionate to the distraught. He was honest in all that he did, and he 
he was obedient to his heavenly father, even when his heavenly father asked him to lay his life down on a cross, because that was his will. Joseph didn't see many of those accomplishments in Jesus' life. And his life certainly bears the mark of a heavenly father, but I also think that Jesus' life reflects the love and humbleness of a small, humble, little earthly man named Joseph, who did his very best, despite his fears, to be a father figure to Jesus. And he did that by loving Mary the very best that he could, by caring for the needs of Jesus when he was a boy, by teaching him the things of God as he understood them to the best of his ability, and by giving him a piece of himself, his trade, his carpentry, so that Jesus could stand for himself. Dad, we just need to understand that we live in a world where fatherhood is being diminished, but it is so very, very important. Be faithful to your family. Be faithful to your children. Train them up in the way they should go. Teach them on the Word of God. Love them. Create an environment where the family is held together. Do all that God has called you to do. You just don't know where that child might go. You don't know what that child might achieve. But when you're out of the picture, when you abandon your role, that child is on a downward spiral. Statistics show it. I don't want to make my children another statistic. I want to make them a servant for the Lord. So I take my responsibility seriously. I hope you take yours seriously.